Depression is a serious mental illness we're still trying to understand. In some of the worst cases, it results in suicide. Professor Bongani Mawetu Mayossi was a talented cardiologist at the University of Cape Town. He committed suicide last Friday. His brother-in-law, Sipo Similani, also attempted suicide three times himself. I spoke to him about Mayossi and if the family knew just how much anguish he was in. Um, Jane, from uh, the statement, you know, which was uh, released by the family, and uh, let me start by saying that, you know, I'm not the family spokesperson, so I'm just going to speak, you know, as a brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. um, the statement, you know, uh, says that, yes, as a family, we knew for the past two years that she was going through, you know, uh, the situation that uh, um, was described in uh, uh, the statement, which is depression, and he was getting help as well. So many people, factors have been blamed for this, the students, the pressures on him under the Fees Must Fall campaign, the, the pressures at the UCT where he worked. Do those pressures exacerbate what goes through somebody's mind in a state like this, or is it your own internal battle? Um, this situation is a very delicate, you know, and complex, you know, uh, situation. And each individual case of depression, stress, and anxiety, you know, uh, is different. You know, when you look at somebody like uh, Professor Mayosi, you know, uh, his uh, status, you know, his uh, um, background, um, he dealt with it, you know, differently. Um, yes, the family, you know, uh, in uh, the past two years, you know, uh, saw this and uh, um, there was, you know, uh, systems put in place. And for somebody else, you no, know, nobody picks it up up until the day when uh, the news breaks. Do you think him being a black man was a factor in this, a black man in that kind of environment where there's so much pressure, where he is seen as a role model? Um, I'd like to look at it differently instead of just looking at uh, the color, you know, um, and also, you know, uh, the highly charged, you know, political situation, you know, in uh, the country. Um, as a man, you know, uh, whether he was black or white, you know, see everybody, you know, uh, uh, academics, you know, uh, you talk about, you know, doctors, there's lawyers, you know, uh, even CEOs, you know, uh, are going through these stresses and uh, pressures. And yes, that period of uh, the fees must, fees must fall also affected a lot of students, you know, who are not heard, you know, and they're going through the same thing as well. Because there's been a dramatic increase in student suicides, a frightening number of students who've taken their lives this year alone, and men, you touched on that, an important point, also on the rise there. What do you think is happening there? I mean, why are we seeing this? Again, is it just the pressures at work, pressure to perform, pressure to never fail? Um, the way that I look at it, Jane, you know, uh, it is not only a South African issue, you know, uh, I was looking at uh, the numbers in uh, the U.S., you know, uh, there's some stats which were released in uh, 2015 saying that, you know, uh, every 12 minutes somebody commits suicide wow. just in the U.S., you know, and those numbers are increasing by 25 to 30 percent, you know, so uh, there is a lot of, you know, uh, pressure in the society, in uh, institutions and organizations, you know, a lot of pressure as well, and coming back, you know, home, when you look, you know, at how violent our society is, you know, people are raped. Little babies, you know, as young as six years old, you know, and uh, there's uh, family members, you know, who are losing their loved ones, you know, uh, through uh, robberies. You know, all that leads and adds up to these, you know, stresses. But the problem is, going back to institutions, you know, and organizations, that even those, there's no safe space, you know, where you can go to your line manager, you know, and assist and get assistance. But why do you think that's the case? I mean, there needs to be somebody to take the pressure off. And if they know that this is happening, also in schools, yes. why um, is there not the facility there? Uh, the problem is, you know, um, which is very sad, companies and institutions, you know, they will tell you that they have a wellness day and they have a wellness facility, referring to only a gym or in or during the wellness day, they only bring in people, you know, to check people's blood pressure, you know, and uh, uh, just to check, you know, uh, certain small, you know, um, items, you know, in uh, the body, and that's it, it ends there. But when you go to your line manager and you say, I have bipolar, 
that then gets used against you, you then get targeted. And as a senior manager, you are then excluded then from you know, uh, future decisions and future plans. You know? So people then tend to die silently and keep it away from reporting, which will then you know, uh, be helping them, but it is the opposite. So the reason is it is uh, misunderstood. And, and there's a stigma as well, isn't there? Oh, don't talk about the stigma. You know, it is stigma. It is shame. It is, you know, a disgust to say, you look perfect. You say you've got depression. It is only for the weak. And you can't be a senior manager or you can't be a professor, you know, and go through that. And you talk about this so eloquently. I mean, you are a man of academia. That's why I know you understand what's happening. Um, at universities and, and schools and, and in your family, and because you too try to take your life. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, going back to 2010, 2011, you know, uh, I was in business, an entrepreneur. I had a product, you know, uh, my own uh, brand, which was listed in uh, the pick and pays. You know, uh, my wife, you know, was also um, an, um, you know, an, um, an entrepreneur. And uh, things were going well, and boom, suddenly, you know, uh, that main switch just fell, just like that. And for me... An internal switch, or...? An internal switch, not ESCOM, mm. but, you know, yeah. it was an internal, you know, uh, main switch, and, you know, uh, there was just no darkness. Uh, I could not see the way out. You know, for me, it was the end. And uh, um, I decided to commit suicide. And my choice of going out with a bang was to hang myself. Wow which I did, but survived after two attempts in one night. And why do you think you survived? And where does that leave you when you survive after trying to take your life? It, it's, it's a daily, lifelong, you know, um, step and healing process, not just for you, because what we don't discuss or talk about, you know, as a, the society, after the shame is that Families are also involved in this. And that is why for me, you know, uh, it took me up until this past weekend when my brother-in-law committed suicide. I said, enough of this shame, I'm coming out. And people and, were shocked. And, and you wrote this book. Yes. Um, a killer in my head, dealing with anxiety, stress, and depression. And your father committed suicide too. Um, I was speaking with some uh, theologians and pastors, you know, um, who were trying to get some meaning spiritually, you know, and a lot of churches, you know, they say that uh, there might be some uh, uh, generational, you know, curses. Yes, my father uh, also committed suicide, but he committed suicide after I did because I tried to commit suicide, you know, in uh, 2011, and in 2013, he then committed suicide. Not a young man. He was 73 years old. So you can see that this happens, you know, to people as young as 10 years old. That is reported, a reported stat of the youngest person in South Africa, you know, who's hanged mm. himself or herself, to a 73 years old who's my father. But he didn't survive, just like me. He didn't get a second chance. What sort of impact does it have on a family? I mean, what does it make you feel like to know that your father was in such pain that you possibly didn't see that he hung himself? And how do you stop it from carrying on in the family? Uh, it is a painful, painful grieving because in a normal death, the family is just grieving. But in this instant, when there's suicide involved, the family is going through emotions at the same time. It is that of grieving this person and bereavement, and then you then add in trauma that nobody speaks about. And probably guilt as well and, that you didn't know. I was, I was coming to that point, you know, Jane, to say, you know, uh, that guilt, because then, you know, uh, after, you know, uh, those emotions, you know, which are there, uh, most families, sadly enough, they choose not to disclose. But in my case, with my father when he passed on, and also with uh, the Mayosi, you know, family, they took a decision that they have to let the nation know and not hide this. And that took out that sting because we have to speak about these things. You know, uh, I wrote about it, you know, I said, black people, 
But now, you know, we see it is not just a black issue to say, people, we need to talk about this shame, this darkness, this silent killer. I really admire you. It's it, amazing to bring this to awareness, as you say, hopefully it'll help remove the stigma attached to it. If you know somebody is in trouble, if you get a sense that something is not right, what should you do? How should you approach them? Uh, my advice is not an, ac an academic advice, you know, because I'm not a doctor, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Mine is just, you know, simple from my experience, from my research, you know, and also, you know, uh, referring to Dr. Schlebusch, you know, Professor Schlebusch, you know, uh, who's had 25 years of doing research, you know, uh, just on this topic that we are speaking about, you know, to say the, the, the most important thing, you know, is to first listen. Yesterday, I had an engagement with a mom who said her son had tried to commit suicide, and at first she was in a dark to say, why is this kid not listening? Why is this kid now lazy? Because he just wanted to sleep and not go out, you know, until this weekend when this incident happened with the professor, the son said, Mom, we need to talk. And she says she could feel her body trembling. Mm. And he said, I've got the same problem. I've got voices in my head. I want to commit suicide. And the mom said she had tears, but she had to hold them in. But she said she had to constrain herself and listen. And that took the whole day of the son just pouring out his pain that the mom had no idea. They were sharing the same roof for years, but the mom had no clue at all. So that listening was the first thing that got the son to trust that this is a safe space. What is your advice to somebody who wants to take their own life? Because it's hard to imagine that you can reach that point, but clearly you do, where taking your own life makes sense. You prepare to go through that, that pain, that anguish. An advice to yourself when you're going through this? You can't advise yourself because, Jane, you've made a decision already. Do you know that the people who commit suicide, you know, they are the smartest people. And the reason why I'm saying that is, you know, we plan our action right to the last detail. I mean, in my case, I made sure that the rope was 10 meters. I checked the strength and the talk, you know, of uh, uh, that uh, um, rope. And when you listen, you know, uh, to other survivors, you know, they will tell you that, you know, we know that the family members, you know, live at this time. And they will check, you know, uh, every other detail, you know, they will pick their spot to say this will be the perfect spot. Like in my case, because I like to speak about my experience, on my way to go and commit suicide, you know, I took a short left, you know, I went to a barber that morning, you know, I had my head shaved, I trimmed, you know, my beard, because when I wanted to be found after committing, you know, suicide, I wanted to be as clean and presentable, you know, so it was not just a haphazard, you know, accidental thing. So the advice to yourself, it's, it's tough, you know, um, you have to have a miraculous, you know, intervention, you know, or when somebody then, then picks up, you know, see, with those small um, ways, you know, where they can say this person, you know, is at risk and they intervene at that split second. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It was amazing hearing your story. Thank you, thank you very you. much. Thank you. People similarly talking to me a little earlier on. Now, thank you for joining me tonight for what's a shortened version of Tonight with Jane Dutton. We've got rolling news starting in the next couple of minutes or so, so do stay with us.